God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. We first met Lowell and Cindy in spaghetti at the spaghetti warehouse parking lot in West End, 2008, summer 2008. It was Storyline's first summer, and we were hosting a party for Storyline Young Professionals and our neighbors from the downtown streets, among whom were Lowell and Cindy. Uh, lunch that day, we had a spaghetti buffet, multi-course thing. We all sat down together at this long table. I don't know, there might have been 20 or 25 of us, or a thousand, you know, preacher count. Uh, but it was an experience for me of the inbreaking kingdom of God, where barriers of money, race, and religion were transcended, and we shared a meal in beloved community together. When Lowell and Cindy asked us if we were a church afterwards, we said, yes, we're a new church in uptown, and we want to work for justice, and we want to practice hospitality like this. And, and then they asked, can we come to your church? And I sure hope it didn't show on my face, but I didn't immediately know how to answer that question. And shame on me for that. Um, God was challenging my tidy notions of ministry and mission. I thought we'd be a church for young professionals that work for justice among its neighbors in poverty and then return to the tidy comforts of middle-class yuppie athletes. Uh, God was poking at my categories and the barriers that existed in my missional imagination. And I said, yes, of course, you can come to our house church gatherings. And then I quickly called one of our mentors in the city, a former pastor and leader of what's now City Square. And I asked him, what should we do? And he promptly reminded me of the book of James and showing favoritism to the rich over the poor. And he told me in no uncertain terms that it was a sin not to include your neighbors in poverty in your gatherings in the same way you would include anyone else. And I knew he was right. Now, that experience changed Storyline's course. Uh, we would be shaped from that point forward by that. Storyline would be a church of radical welcome and inclusion. There'd be room at the same table for everyone. And really, our years since then have been a journey of discovering how to grow deeper into that kind of radical welcome and inclusion. That learning experience removed social barriers we'd put up between rich and poor, but there was something else that needed to be dislodged, at least for me. Um, I still carried this notion that somehow we were going to help our poor neighbors. We would figure out what was keeping the poor in poverty and fix it. We would fix them, and we would do that with the gospel, and we would share the gospel with them, and the gospel would liberate them uh, with our help, of course, and then we could put it on our block. Uh, we were sitting around the living room of Ryan and Claudia Porsche's apartment in uptown Dallas on a Sunday afternoon, right across from West Village. They had such a great view from that little corner. Yeah. We were having a conversation about scripture together, and Lowell was sitting on the blue suede couch against the wall, and a question was put forward as we were talking about the Bible, something like, how can we learn to trust God to provide for us? And the young professionals might have heard this question asking how we might trust God instead of our wealth, but Lowell heard this question differently. He broke into the conversation and shared, I trust God every day because I have to. Sometimes I don't know where my next meal is going to come. Sometimes I don't know where I'm going to sleep that night. I have to trust God to survive because if God doesn't take care of me, I've got nothing. In that moment, I realized that we weren't bringing the gospel to Lowell. Lowell was bringing the gospel to us. Lowell was mentoring us. We young professionals were learning to trust God by seeing Lowell trust God. Not long after that day, Lowell and Cindy approached us and said, we want to make Storyline our church. And we get this disability check every month from the government. Can we tithe that to Storyline? They were some of the first financial partners in Storyline. 
they taught us about generosity. And of course, you know, it wasn't a one-sided relationship as, as genuine relationships are. It became this beautiful reciprocity and mutuality where we, we did need each other and love each other um, and encouraged each other in genuine relationship. But Lowell and Cindy were the beginning of a long line of people through whom we have encountered God at our margins. Raj, Darcy, Kenny, um, Kateba, Hassan, Garrett, many others are a part of this unfolding story. This experience of finding God at our margins, this is not an anomaly. This is the way that God works in the world. Mary was an impoverished teenage girl of color. And she received a visit from God's angel, Gabriel, that she would give birth to Israel's Messiah. She was scared by the news, but she trusted God's message to her. She waited in hope. She teaches us what it means to trust God and wait in hope. Womanist theologian Will Gaffney would have us notice that two women, Mary and her cousin Elizabeth, are the chosen conduits of God's work in the world in this origin story. And in a patriarchal context, when the testimony of a female was not credible or trusted, when women were viewed merely as fields to bear the fruit of offspring, God arrives in the world through these females. The male in the story, Zechariah, is actually the one who disbelieves and resists God's message and is silenced for it. God's like, nope, you don't get to talk about this. I need a more worthy candidate. And it was Mary, the teenager. Mary teaches us to trust God and to wait in hope. She teaches us that God arrives at the margins. God arrives through the meek and not the mighty. She declares, my soul magnifies the Holy One. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. God's loving kindness is for those who fear God. From generation to generation, God has shown the strength of God's arm. God has scattered the arrogant in the intent of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has helped God's own child, Israel, a memorial to God's mercy, just as God said to our mothers and fathers, to Hagar and Sarah and Abraham, to their descendants forever. Mary's declaration, her Magnificat, is all the more stunning when we take into account that Israel has been under Roman oppression for hundreds of years, and the prophetic office has been largely silent for most of that time. It had been a dumpster fire for Israel for hundreds of years. Folks were wondering, what is God up to? Has God forgotten us? Is God punishing us? And yet, when Mary, the teenager, receives this message, she embraces it. She's ready for it. Further, Mary only has a promise at this point. She's had an angelic vision. There's no baby yet. There's no tangible infantile evidence to display. And what's more is she has reason to disbelieve that this is true. It would be scandalous for her to be pregnant before being married. What would she tell Joseph? It would bring shame on her. It would bring shame on Joseph. It would be, bring shame on their families if people found out. And how could they not? But it's no matter. To Mary. This is God's Messiah. This is God's promise to Israel. She trusts God. She waits in hope. I wonder if Mary trusts God for the same reason Lowell did, because she has to, because she sees no better way. She has to trust God to survive. If God doesn't take care of her, then she's got nothing. Karl Marx's words are often quoted that religion is the opiate of the masses. But Lowell and Mary lead me to wonder instead if power is the opiate of the elite. Affluence and power with their illusions of control and stability numb us and distract us from trusting God. The religion of Jesus 
is for those whose backs are against the wall, in the words of Howard Thurman. And we wonder if it's worth trusting in God, if it's worth waiting in hope, or if we should just go it alone. We hear Lowell saying, I trust God every day because I have to. When we struggle with how to identify the work of God in relation to global pandemics, white supremacy, homophobia, and a planet on fire, we hear Mary declaring, before she ever saw it with her own eyes, God has brought down the powerful and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has helped God's own child. Mary's story reveals to us that our spiritual renewal as a community of mostly middle-class, reasonably well-off white folks will come, as it always has, through those at our margins. It will come not as shame and judgment, but as grace and beauty and hope. It may come through our children through our non-religious neighbors, through our queer neighbors, through neighbors of color, or through neighbors who are socially displaced. They'll teach us to trust in God, to wait in hope, and to receive our belovedness from God. A question for this Advent then is, uh, will we show up and wait for God at our margins? Uh, I'm curious uh, just to hear from you all. That's the most of my message before we shift into our Avrant offering stuff. But how are you seeing God at work at your margins lately? Or anything else you would like to say or comment on or talk about re related to this, you know, within reason? Anybody? How are you seeing God at work at your margins lately? Um, can you hear me? <laughs> turn, turn around three times to your left. If you can hear me. Ben, is that you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think of, uh, the student population that I serve, uh, ACU online, the, Majority of the students, we have a majority minority population, um, adult learners, and I've been I've been consistently struck, but learning more about the way in which higher education, particularly Christian higher education, is increasingly inaccessible uh, to those who um, aren't at the center of power, uh, and trying to uh, trying to listen to our students and learn from them, not just for, uh, right, they're, they're getting an education from us, but that we have so much to learn from them on what it means to be invited into God's longing for human flourishing. Um, I don't know, it, uh, there's a part of me that feels like, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm talking about people who are, uh, not necessarily at the margins, but in so many ways they are uh, uh, for um, for an institution of power, an institution of um, uh, whiteness, historically, um, trying to learn from them, trying to listen to their stories. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Hmm. 
Thanks for sharing that, Ben. Yeah, I see the way that that, that pokes at the typical kind of university model or higher ed model of education where information and knowledge goes from the center out rather than vice versa. And man, it turns things on its head to imagine how, how the teachers learn from their students. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? How are you seeing God at work at your margins lately? Uh, yeah, I got to get you a mic. Um, I was just thinking, we have this couple of foster kids from us that are older, so they pay their buddies and they don't have kids. They don't have a church community, mm. but are just they don't have a church community because they've not been welcomed in ones they have sought out. And they just make such an effort to pour into our kids and to extend hospitality to us. I think they're so hungry to share that with someone. Um, they, Charlie just started playing soccer and they came to her, her games and when she scored a goal, they would take her out for ice cream and um, they cleared a space in a bedroom at their house so that um, if we, shoot, I got a kid in here, but if we wanted to hide Christmas presents at their house, they let us know that they made a space in a bedroom um, where they would hide them for us and would wait up on Christmas Eve for the kids to go to bed so we could come get them. And um, they, they just uh, exude hospitality and it just hurts my heart every time that they haven't found a place to, to serve and connect and to be able to, they just have so much to offer. And um, for us to have these kind of conversations when people on the margins are already looking how to serve us and extend hospitality to us um, is so humbling. and. I don't know, so much like Jesus to do that kind of thing. Thanks, Julie. Um, I don't have a specific, specific thing, but like Charles said, as the years have gone on and meeting different people in different situations, that's how I see God. Like I've done all the... Bible studies and obligatory quiet times. Sorry if that's your thing. Um, all the conferences, I, you know, went to a private Christian college and basically had to minor in Bible because they make you. But I just, I feel like through Storyline and through the people that we've met, like Cindy and Lowell and Darcy and different people along the way, and even not connected to Storyline, just people in my community and my neighborhood, um, that's where I see God. And I think the most, the biggest aha moment or the poking, like you said, was people who showed me God or who acted like Jesus, but didn't do it in his name. Because mm -hmm. see, I thought, the people who are doing the best in the world and bringing light and bringing hope, we're doing it in God's name and Jesus's name. But that kind of turned itself on ahead when I kept meeting people who were more concerned about their communities, social injustice, the environment, their schools, who were not Christians. Mm -hmm. And to be able for my world to kind of open up and see that God is working through them too, that was huge for me that they don't have to be doing it in his name, mm -hmm. her name. Like they don't have to, they, they can be doing it and I can see it and smile and know that like, that's God's love working, whether they call it that or not. Yeah. And that was a big, it still continues to be a big thing for me too. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We haven't often had uh, the, 
churches we grew up in, a lot of them didn't have categories for God things happening, not in God's name or outside of the people of God. Right. Right. That's right. And I, I think we have the resources in our story to make sense of that. If humanity is made in the image of God, and if the Spirit of God is at work in the world, then really it shouldn't surprise us if, if, if even unwittingly, people living out of the image within them fight for justice, advocate for those who are oppressed, do right and do good. Well, of course they are, <laughs> because God made us that way, right? They're, uh, and somehow the image of God is not irreparably tarnished by the brokenness in the world. There's still some beauty and goodness in there. Yeah. I mean, we need, we're messed up too. We're a hot mess. We need forgiveness and grace and mercy. Uh, but yeah, we're, uh, humanity's not irretrievably horrible, <laughs> right? Like there's, yeah. 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 